Um, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lynn Ureña, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies. And today I'm going to be the moderator of this panel. First of all, I would like to thank the guest speakers, George, Alejandro, and Miguel, for, because this panel was, th this event was organized rather hastily, and they <laughs> um, uh, accepted our invitation and to come here and prepare their presentation. And so we are very grateful to have them here and give, give, a, and give us the perspective of what's happening in Venezuela right now. Um, each of the panelists will have 20 minutes to give their presentation and then we're going to open it up and take comments and questions from the public. So I just re I just um, want you to um, not, please don't, do not interrupt the presentations and hold your questions and comments till the end. And we're going to start with Miguel Tinker Salas, who is a professor of Latin American history at Pomona College. And he's the author of the Enduring Legacy, Oil, Culture, and Society in Venezuela, which came out with Duke University Press in 2009. And he's also the author of the forthcoming book, Venezuela, What Everyone Needs to Know, um, with Oxford University Press. Hello, Muchas gracias. Es un placer estar, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking English. Um, glad you all can make it, glad you're here. Um, I have been in Venezuela for the last two months um, and actually uh, living uh, what we're going to be talking about today um, in many ways. Now I'll turn my time because I've been told to have uh, um, So my, my perspective is, is actually trying to reflect on what has caused the current crisis. Um, as a, as a historian and also as, as a Venezuelan American. Um, what precipitated the crisis? I think it's almost cliche to say that Venezuela faces serious economic and social problems. Some the result of government mismanagement or incompetence, others uh, produced by distortions generated by dependence on the oil economy, um, and others uh, part of a concerted campaign to destabilize the government. Food shortages, skyrocketing inflation, a crime rate uh, that it has also skyrocketed are some of the fundamental problems that Venezuela faces. These issues should be addressed as part of a national conversation which involves all political sectors in Venezuela, uh, a process that, some of you may know, began last night and one hopes will continue. One of the troubling features, however, of the current political crisis and the political setting is that, it, that Venezuela lacks a traditional political opposition willing to challenge the government while at the same time respecting the outcome of democratic elections. The absence of a democratic opposition creates serious problems for the country, generating a heightened confrontational political culture that impacts the discourse and the policy choices of both the right and the left. The absence of a democratic opposition allows the left to act as if it is constantly besieged and not address issues of accountability and allows sectors of the right to radicalize the process and engage in violent street actions making politics an all or nothing proposition. At the end of the January of 2014, Leopoldo Lopez and Maria Corina Machado, leaders of the radical right wing of the opposition, organized under the banner of La Salida, the exit, proposing the departure of the Democratic elected president Nicolás Maduro by any means, which harkens back to 2002 when similar forces attempted to oust Chávez under the banner Hasta Que Se Vaya, reducing the campaign to a singular demand and the complete absence of concrete proposals to deal with the serious problems that the country faces underlines and underscores the limited appeal that these protests have had among poor sectors and the overarching class nature of the protest. The timing of the campaign had two objectives. One, create conditions of ungovernability that would increase public discontent and force Maduro's ouster while promoting the leadership of Lopez and Machado. 
Divisions between the opposition were evident before the protests began and came to the surface during a private meeting held in February in which Capriles, in fact, labeled Lopez's strategy suicide. <clears throat> the absence of a traditional opposition is evident in the fact that the right-wing political parties operate as if Chavez and now Maduro's elections were an aberration. The view betrays a belief that the majority of the population is incapable of making an informed decision. This leads the opposition to repeatedly reject the outcome of national elections, insisting that they have always been rigged, even though the process has actually produced opposition victories in the National Assembly and the mayorship of several important cities. The nature of the current protest highlights the very fractured and stratified nature of Venezuelan society and the centrality of class as a distinguishing feature of the country's social structure. Here you have an example of some of the, and I've asked the question, psychological warfare or real commandos. Um, it circulates in the social webs uh, and that proposes how to organize the guarimbas, the attacks uh, on uh, the generalized population. And here we have examples of what those protests are. I took the picture myself. It was in Merida, and it was an effort to blockade the uh, access to Las Americas uh, in, the, in the area of Merida. <coughs> For decades, the middle and upper classes benefited from a national narrative and government policies that promoted oil as the principal agent of modernization in Venezuela. Class and class privilege informs a sense of ownership over the country and its resources, especially the oil industry. As I have pointed out in my own work, controlling the nation's purse string, controlling the nation's purse strings, the oil industry historically promoted a set of social and class values, while it also constrained, constrained the power of the state. The Chavez election produced a paradigm shift, and it's not uncommon to hear many middle class opponents lament, he perdido mi país, I have lost my country. These groups lament that they no longer recognize themselves in a national narrative that foregrounds previously marginalized social classes. It is this sense of ownership and angst over lost privilege that leads some members of the middle class opposition to justify radical efforts at destabilization to recover their country, such as what has happened for the last two months. And here are examples of blocking Arielas Americas and using barbed wire and using metal wire uh, across the streets. Paradoxically, class and class bias displace any commonality of interest, and yet opposition discourse manipulates a nationalist discourse to promote its own self-interest. Besides the wars of independence against Spain, which actually unfolded as a bloody internal civil war where race and class played a central role, Venezuela has little in the way of a common shared past. This helped explain why for decades elites manipulated the legacy of the independent process and why the leadership of Simón Bolívar was cast a long shadow over the history of, and popular imaginary of the nation. Only recently has there been efforts to complicate the nation's history and introduce other individuals and events and figures into the national discourse. Since independence, the country has not sustained any wars with its neighbors. The 19th century was marked by a succession of civil wars in which class and race once again fueled tensions, and the early part of the 20th century was dominated by a succession of Andean rulers. The discovery of oil in the early decades of the 20th century increased tensions over control of the state and inserted Venezuela into the U.S. sphere of influence. By the 1930s, oil had become the dominant industry, increasing tensions for control of the state since control of the state implied control of the nation's purse strings. One of the dominant features of the protests in the last two months has been the appearance of protests in the states of Táchira and Mérida, in the Andean area. And protests in the western states of Táchira and Mérida preceded the larger demonstrations that happened in Caracas on February 12th, and were reportedly sparked by the attempted rape of a university student. Authorities in Táchira claim that no complaint was filed. However, it is clear that what is clear is that approximately 50 mass students, protesters, attacked the governor's residence, inflicting damage to the property. As is the case with everything in Venezuela, developments in the border state of Táchira are more complex than they initially appeared. Business sectors in Táchira promise profit tremendously from illicit trade of subsidized Venezuelan goods, products sent to Colombia as contraband where they are sold at much higher prices. Some observers estimate that upwards of 30% of Venezuelan basic food products exit the country as contraband. Venezuelan products in short supply uh, in Merida and Táchira can be found in Cúcuta and throughout northern Santander, uh, the province of, uh, where Cúcuta resides. As a result, in the states of Táchira and Merida, uh, store shelves are bare. I've stood in line for hours to buy basic products. People have to stand in line the same way to buy these products. And not only is it contraband of basic goods, but also of gasoline. As you know, gas in Venezuela is 10 cents a gallon. And, and in fact, over 100,000 barrels of gasoline exits the country as contraband to Colombia a year, a subsidy of about $12 billion uh, to the national government. The efforts to control this illicit trade have, in fact, generated displeasure among certain groups in the Andean regions, 
and they have, in fact, began to protest. And so you have a protest er happening uh, from business sectors at the same time that a protest is being generated among certain groups of students, and they both then coalesce into what has happened in the northern part of Tachira. The other phenomena that's interesting about the issue of Tachira and Merida is the use of a gocho identity, something that has harkens back to the 19th century uh, and harkens back to an identity that was largely uh, viewed as a the ba backward country bunkin, and that now is being used uh, in, a, in a rather uh, uh, interesting way, being racialized as an Andean identity uh, that is predominantly whiter and at the same time uh, um, uh, mad, arrecho, the word is used, bochos arrechos, uh, and posters and banners proclaiming bochos uh, and bocho power have been common in rallies in Merida and Táchira. Here you have an example of residents in Táchira opposing that very identity by removing barricades themselves rather than simply allowing them to take place. The gocho identity draws inspiration from a forlong past in which Andean rulers dominated Venezuela from 1898 into 1958, and harkens also to the notion of a media luna, that is the creation of a separate space within Venezuela, similar to the media luna in Bolivia uh, that attempted uh, secession uh, against the government of Evo Morales. Another important feature that I found fascinating about the protest, not that I found the, the violence like this burning of uh, the University of Táchira fascinating, but was the role of women in the protest. Uh, here you have an example of what that image was. Um, and you have the convergence of the gocha identity with this hyper-masculinity uh, that is being promoted. And the, the issue of the women is interesting because it's the leadership role of middle and upper class women. Modeling Cuban women in white, in white the, the movement in Cuba. Uh, conservative opposition women dress in white as well to protest against the government uh, in Venezuela, in Caracas, and elsewhere. The women's marches, however, do not challenge patriarchy or traditional gender roles. In fact, the opposite has occurred. At various opposition rallies, some women have taken to promoting a hyper-masculinity, baiting men to confront authorities, and when they do not, they question their virility. Opposition social media has been circulating pictures, as I've indicated previously, of this young woman here uh, with her proclamation about her uh, capacity uh, and the incapacity of men. Um, it's also been very clear that they've been active in the protests. And here you have a semi sort of example, mujeres con ovarios y militares simbólicos, challenging the military uh, in terms of a gender construction that does not challenge patriarchy, but that is essentially is promoting it. Uh, and you have the same thing in terms of the women's opposition in white, the protests that they've had, and Maria Corina Machado being one of the spear leaders of that, of that the spearheads of that movement. Um, so that you have that as an other important phenomenon. Um, the other factor that's important in addressing the protests is how the extent to which fear has been used to actually try to consolidate the opposition. Um, and it's rather tragic that both the right and the left in Venezuela tend to operate in a self-imposed echo chamber, getting news from sources that affirm their views uh, and socializing with a group of like-minded individuals. Fear is evident over the loss of status, the empowerment of the poor, people of color, and more recently, the most, the most interesting part is, most recently, is the fact of a purported Cuban presence operating in Venezuela. Living in a neighborhood in Merida uh, that was barricaded, forcefully barricaded every day, um, I was told that the, that the barriers were needed to protect the community from marauding bands of motorizados, uh, people on motorbikes, uh, the riot police, the National Guard, the Avispas Negras, supposed Cuban commandos, uh, allegedly operating in Venezuela. The opposition assumed that motorizados, motorcycle riders, were government supporters. Um, and they demonized the motorizados and even racialized them, uh, since most people who bought cheap Chinese bicycles were from lower socioeconomic classes and tended to be people of color. Uh, one day I sat outside my apartment and I asked um, individuals why, we were, why they were blocking the road. Uh, and they said, Tupamaros were coming. Tulamaros is a group in Venezuela that takes its name from the group in Uruguay, but is also a political party. And interestingly, they were also present last night in the dialogue with Jose Pinto being present uh, in the dialogue with the president and the opposition leaders. Um, then it was that the motorizados were coming. Then it was that the uh, grupos antimotines were coming, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the uh, police, the informed police were coming. Then it was the avispas negras. In the end, nobody came. But the fear was used during the entire course of the day, and I would suggest during the entire course of the marches, to actually whip up the sentiment that somehow we were under attack. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the actual barricades were being promoted by individuals who had tractors, and they brought out cranes uh, uh, to actually blockade the road. These are not cheap enterprises. Someone was financing and someone was paying for it um, during this entire process. Uh, and in many ways, if you 
accept the fact or you view the fact that their people are operating within this echo chamber, then you can confirm the rumors because you go on social media and they say the Cubans have landed in Venezuela. They say the motorizados are coming. So you have this echo chamber on one hand and then you have this self-fulfilling prophecy on the other hand in which this fear then is used uh, to create conformity and to push forward this notion uh, that, that people are under attack or on the verge of being attacked. The opposition is also united behind the claim that Maduro is not Venezuelan. That he is, so we have a birther movement in Venezuela as well. Um, there's an active bir birther movement, very similar. Uh, obviously, this is a made-up photo. Don't, don't assume that Maduro held up the sign saying he was Colombian. Um, uh, there was an active birther movement uh, similar to what Obama faced, uh, and that continues to decry that Maduro is really Colombian. They purport that he was born in Cucuto, Colombia, as you see in the sign, but he was actually raised in San Antonio, uh, when in fact Maduro claims he was born in Caracas. Uh, they insist that the birth registry in Cúcuta has been ripped out of the book uh, and there have been several lawsuits filed against uh, Maduro claiming the, that the election should be annulled because he was in fact a Colombian. Uh, once again, the underlying assumption reflects a sense of ownership over what is Venezuela, who can define what is Venezuela, and how Venezuela should be defined. Following this logic, Maduro is not really a Venezuelan, the same way that Chavez was simply an uneducated, uncultured, racially mixed Llanero, plainsman. Moreover, Maduro's class background, he was a bus driver, clashes with many class notions of who should be a leader. The irony is that while they ridicule his working class roots, they allowed Lula of Brazil, a former socialist worker and union organizer, as the moderate they seek to emulate. Since, <coughs> since the 1959 period, when Venezuela uh, entered a period of democracy in 58 and 59, for middle and upper class Venezuelans, Cuba served as the antithesis of the social and political model taking shape in Venezuela. After the Cuban Revolution, Venezuela's democracy became the model for the region, promoted by Washington and the political class in Venezuela in order to legitimate their authority. Therefore, it is not surprising that the conservative opposition has once again resurrected the fear of Cuba as a centerpiece of recent protests. This is actually a picture of the city del Caribe in Margarita where you began to see, because Cubans participated, you began to see uh, the attack on Cuba be unfolding. Um, the opposition protests uh, held a march in Caracas uh, against the purported interference of Cuba uh, in Venezuela. Although no palpable evidence exists except the fact that Cubans participate in Barrio Adentro, a medical program, uh, and there are medical advisors and also sports advisors. Among the opposition, alleged Cuban involvement in Venezuela is an article of faith. The Cubans are supposedly everywhere. Maduro is represented as a puppet of Fidel and Raul. Uh, supposedly he receives his marching orders from Havana. And shortages in the country are the result of the fact that Venezuela is shipping food and oil to Cuba. Yes, it does ship oil as part of Petro Caribe, uh, but the reality is that it's not uh, the reason why there are shortages in Venezuela. Uh, moreover, Cuban military supposedly dominates the, military high, the Venezuelan military high command. The opposition insists that Cuban soldiers dress as Venezuelan national guardsmen in order to uh, confront protesters in room barricades. Opposite social media goes so far as to report that Cuban sharpshooters are behind the killings of students uh, and of National Guard members. The Cuban presence has also been racialized. Opposition members have told journalists that they can spot a Cuban, and when asked why, because, quote, they are darker than average Venezuelans. By seeking Maduro's ouster through undemocratic means, the opposition has once again found itself in a callejón sin salida, a political dead end. The debacle of the 2022 and 2003 oil strike cost the country close to $14 billion in lost revenue. It is estimated that the current protests may have already cost the country upwards of $10 billion. There is no evidence that broad sectors of society, especially the urban poor, <coughs> who provide most of the support for the government, have joined the protests initiated by the middle and upper class sectors. The opposition claims that armed groups patrol the barrios to prevent the poor from protesting betray their own inability to see beyond their own interests. The position highlights the refusal to consider the possibility that Venezuela has changed and that people from other social sectors are capable of making informed decisions and are not simply pawns of the government. Venezuela, in my opinion, needs dialogue. Hope that for the first time happened last night in which we saw in a rather difficult context, nonetheless, we saw the opposition meeting with the government. This is a picture of the meeting last night. Um, and, and there's still a lot we can deconstruct of this meeting. Uh, the fact that there, were only, there was only one woman present. The fact that everyone was um, 
of a, of a senior age. I don't mean that as an attack on anybody, but, but the, the, uh, the demographics of the, uh, of the meeting were rather interesting as well, beyond the gender balance. Uh, and the fact that they talked from 8 o'clock, 8.16 till 1 o'clock in the morning. By around 12 o'clock, I was falling asleep. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it was a start. Um, Venezuela needs dialogue, and the hope is that for the first time, um, the government and the opposition can sit down, uh, engage in the conversations, condemn violence as a way out of the Venezuelan crisis, and foment instead of coexistence, because only together will there be an opportunity to discuss and to begin to address the serious problems that the country faces. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miguel. And now we're going to hear from George Chicariello Manhart. He's Assistant Professor of Political Science at Drexel University, and he's the author of We Created Chavez, A People's History of the Venezuelan Revolution, published by Duke University Press in 2013. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me. It's a delight to be on a panel so rich with so much historical sensibility. Uh, and to be able to look at these contemporary events through these, you know, these very nuanced and detailed historical lenses that, uh, that these uh, other historians, but myself as a political science, hope to contribute to as well. Armed thugs, Chavista, Chavista militias, paramilitaries. These are just some of the hyperbolic terms that you may have heard attached recently to another term that suddenly emerged as a central bogeyman of the Venezuelan opposition today, the colectivos. Some have publicly scratched their heads as to the recent popularity of this term which says so little, literally, the collectives, but seems to mean so much. It's in the gap between these two that I really want to try to pull at and, and establish the function of this term for the protest state in Venezuela. Collective seems to refer most directly to the grassroots revolutionary collectives that constitute the most organized element of Chavismo. But beyond this, it really loses all kind of clarity. Judging from opposition hysterics, and I don't like to use the term hysteria, but I have a hard time finding a replacement sometimes. The collectives are armed, but only a small part of revolutionary Chavista organizations are armed, making the choice of the term peculiar indeed. If the origin and recent popularity of the term colectivos is hazy and lacking any kind of clear referent, this becomes even more dangerously problematic in practice. On February 12th, it was widely claimed that the student protester Basil Costa was shot by armed collectives. On February 19th, videos were circulated claiming that colectivos were rampaging through the wealthy zone of Altamira, firing hundreds of live rounds. And when the young beauty queen, Genesis Carmona, was killed, her death was instantaneously blamed on, you guessed it, Colectivos, whatever that means. As it turned out, Acosta was killed by uniformed and plain clothes intelligence officials who have since been arrested. Those present in Altamira on the 19th were not colectivos, according to the opposition mayor, and not firing live rounds at all. And Genesis Carmona was shot from behind, while the only Chavistas nearby seemed to have been at least two blocks in the opposite direction. And yet these claims, and many like them, circulated tirelessly and unproblematically throughout the Twitter sphere, throughout a global mainstream media, especially internationally, and on occasionally respectable blogs like Caracas Chronicles. These are just a few examples, but really, uh, you know, another way to look at this is to look at, for example, the total number of deaths in Venezuela. Judging by the rhetoric, you would think these would have all been caused, or many of them caused, or most of them caused by these so-called thugs, militias, uh, and armed paramilitaries, and yet um, there's no way that that kind of claim, the claim that these groups are even substantially contributing to the violence in Venezuela, um, on the par with, say, even security forces of the state or the opposition protesters themselves, 
there's no way that that stands up to any kind of serious scrutiny. And so then this raises a series of questions. How to make sense of the mobility, the mutability, and the sheer contagion of the shadowy term colectivos? We find hints by asking, firstly, how have these colectivos been identified? It's not by weapons, since most of those tarred with the term have not been armed, which leaves us with a much more traditional set of markers that are simultaneously economic, political, and racial. Poor, dark-skinned, wearing a red shirt is enough to be deemed a collective member these days. The very emptiness of the signifier thus speaks directly to its function. Colectivo today says more about its subject than about its object, more about the one speaking it than about the one of which it is spoken. It is not a description of an actual thing in the world, but a confession of a desperate fear that has only grown in, among Venezuelan elites in proportion to the increasing political visibility and influence of the poor <coughs> and darker skinned. Colectivos thus joins a long and sordid list from the traditional denunciations of the rabble, the mob, the scum, the horde, and the lumpen, to more specific and recent variants like the Bomados, as we mentioned, and in 2002, especially the terror circles, referring to the Bolivarian circles. Since what is feared, above all, is mobility and unpredictability, I can't also neglect the motorizados, a term so vague as to trouble translation. Are these any people on motorcycles? Are they motorcycle couriers? Are they taxi drivers? Or just simply anyone you don't like who happens to be wearing a red shirt on a motorcycle? And this is not something that's limited to the contemporary conflictive context. It's very common if you watch something on, on like Twitter to see uh, wealthy residents of Caracas tweeting out pictures of people on motorcycles in Altamira saying, look, the Tupumaros are in Altamira. Essentially, policing the free transit of the city uh, by people that they deem to be dangerous enemies. The recent popularization of the term colectivos is thus an exercise in opposition myth-making, and dangerous myth-making at that. By dehumanizing and objectifying all those it snares in its descriptive net, it legitimizes violence against them. Thus, when the retired general Angel Rivas tweeted the brutal suggestion to hang barbed wire at neck height on the barricades to, quote, neutralize the motorcycle hordes, several deaths seem to have been the result. And just this week, on the same day that an opposition student uh, was stripped naked at the UCR, prompting outcry and solidarity, a Chavista student was severely beaten at the UCR as well for the mere suspicion of being a member of a colectivo. There are, however, those who see in this expression of elite anxiety something more fundamental and specific. As Reynaldo de Turiza put it recently, to demonize the collectives is to demonize organization. Seizing upon this pejorative term and inverting it reveals a positive content, namely that revolutionary grassroots organizations are the backbone and foundation of the Bolivarian process in Venezuela. The fear of the colectivos, of the collectives, constitutes a tacit recognition of this importance. And its contradictions also reveal something else as well. The opposition simultaneously demonizes the collectives for being both dangerously beyond the authority of the state, but also as the blind followers of that state's leadership. The reality is much more the former, that the popular revolutionary organizations, which I document extensively in, in my book with Creed and Chavez, both preceded Chavez by decades and exceeded and continued to exceed Chavismo in terms of the, their demands and the autonomy that they maintain. It's no coincidence that Iturriza, for whom the colectivos are synonymous with organization, is also the current Minister of Communes in Venezuela. 
because it's toward the communal project, one which is simultaneously political and economic, that much popular energy has been dedicated in recent years. This is because these popular organizations, so slandered today as colectivos, have always stood at the vanguard of the struggle for a new kind of state and a new kind of productive apparatus. In this struggle, the movements often outpaced and leapt beyond the state and their own political leadership. The demand for both socialism, but also for a more direct form of democracy to replace Venezuela's corrupt two-party liberal democracy, emerged directly from decades of struggle by the movements themselves. Long before the Bolivarian government institutionalized communal councils for directly democratic local participation, those engaged in grassroots struggles had pioneered barrio assemblies years before. Years before Venezuelan communes entered into the law, movements were building these from below on the ground. And if their autonomy in doing so were not perfectly clear already, the commoner network, the Red de Comuneros, initially a state-affiliated institution, voted recently to detach itself and to operate independently. What the communes embody today in Venezuela is the hope that popular participation will continue to expand, and moreover, that it will gain some economic teeth. And this speaks directly to the, the question of the economic difficulties the country faces today. By drawing together institutions of political participation with economic production, the hope is that socialism will be able to emerge hand in hand with the ever more ambitious claim to self-government. The task is far from an easy one, and the future of it far from certain. The communes frighten not only the Venezuelan opposition, but also entrenched Chavista political and economic elites as well. Now, while Alejandro is going to discuss as well uh, the question of popular participation in the protest today, if there's a reason that radicals are not in the streets alongside these protests, despite the fact that they suffer from the same shortages, they wait in the same lines, if we're talking about insecurity, the poor suffer disproportionately from the street violence, it's because the solution that many envision does not involve handing more money over to the import capitalists who produce nothing, but cutting them out of the equation entirely. And because many recognize that this can only be truly considered once the country's productive base has been rebuilt on a very different foundation. Now to conclude just very briefly, I want to note what may be obvious to some, that we stand before you on a very important day. Twelve years ago, deaths on the streets were used to justify a coup against Chavez that was reversed a mere 47 hours later. I won't argue that what's happening today in Venezuela is exactly the same as what happened 12 years ago today. Much has indeed changed. Instead, I raise the importance of the anniversary to make two closing points. The first is that campaign rhetoric aside, the events of 12 years ago remain the best indication that we have of what the Venezuelan opposition looks like in power. All legitimate branches of government abolished, the constitution scrapped, state and grassroots media shut down by force, popular organizations under military attack, dozens dead in the streets. Some of those same individuals who sat in yesterday's dialogue accusing the Maduro government of violating articles of the Constitution were those who approved of, applauded, and in the case of Leopoldo Lopez, insist that we should be proud of the events of April 11, 2002. The second and more fundamental point, however, is that the coup 12 years ago failed through the popular participation of the masses in the street. As extolled in the popular phrase, todo se tiene su trece, every 11th has its 13th. And playing a powerful 
arguably essential role in the effort to restore Venezuelan democracy, in part because some of them were indeed armed and used those weapons to protect and restore democracy, were none other than those so roundly slandered and demonized today as colectivos. Thank you. So last but definitely not least, we're going to hear from Alejandro Velasque, Velasco, who is Assistant Professor of Latin American Studies at New York University's Gallatin School. And he's the author of the forthcoming book, um, Barrio Rising, Urban Protests and Popular Politics in Venezuela with University of California Press. Thank you so much, um, uh, Lenny, for the invitation and Francesca for the organization of the event and all of you for attending. Um, I think one of the unfortunate features of being a panel that um, that is, I don't think it was hastily arranged, but that is quickly arranged is that um, we don't have an opportunity to coordinate our, our conversations. And so some of what I'm saying, I'm going to say, um, has already been mentioned, and so I'll try as much as possible to, um, to skip over some of that, but those parts. The major question that I have is one that, as George suggested, um, seems to be a paradox of these movements, or this particular moment in Venezuela, which is, where are popular sectors, if not in the streets, um, and specifically given the social and economic conditions, which are great, um, why have not more um, popular sectors seem to have taken to the streets in support? Um, so that's the that's the riddle that I'm going to try to parse out. Um, drawing on some of the information that, um, as Lenny mentioned, my book tries to cover, which is um, thinking in one particular case, um, one popular sector, one barrio um, in Venezuela, in Caracas, in particular called Medina Sanera, which I'll describe, and then um, to uh, meditate on uh, how the experience over the last 50 years, the political experience in this particular neighborhood um, can help us to, to decipher this room. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to start the, by just uh, lending some of the immediate context to what's been going on um, based a little bit on what Nita had mentioned, which is um, that even though this is a cycle of unrest um, in, uh, in uh, Minnesota currently, it is a cycle, which is to say that we have seen similar forms or similar cycles of contentious protests, violence in the streets, etc. Um, this is important because I think um, uh, highlighting that it's not novel, at least in uh, some significant ways, um, helps to hopefully um, tone down a little bit of the rhetoric um, that, uh, that otherwise tends to imagine that this is it, right? That this is the moment when Venezuela is going to go over the brink. Right? The fact is that we have seen some, some moments similar uh, in the past, and Venezuelans seem to have always been able to find a way to step back from the brink. And so I think that in itself even in just in terms of recent history, is a, is a source of, of hopefulness um, regarding this moment. There are those some particular differences to this moment, which then incide directly upon the question of where the barrios are. The first one is that, as um, both George and Miguel mentioned, the government is actually in a very weakened position vis-a-vis um, -vis other moments in its recent past. Not just in terms of its social economic indicators, as um, you mentioned, inflation is very high, one of the highest in the world, and security is a well acknowledged, widely acknowledged problem affecting um, Venezuela, although the specific figures are debated. Um, shortages of products um, uh, due to lack of uh, domestic investment, which is a sort of a, a, a standard feature of the petro state, not just this particular um, Chavista moment, but the petro state in general. Um, the de uh, devaluation of the currency in context of, um, of a very high black market rate for, uh, for dollars because of currency controls, right? Um, all of these suggest that, again, sort of the social economic indicators are significant and these have weakened the government further in a context in which it is emerging from the death of its, um, of its you know, ideological leader, Chavez, in Mar March of last year. On the highly contested way in which his successor, um, uh, Nicolás Maduro, won the presidency a month after um, uh, 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 Chavez's death. Right? Um, so again, uh, these features suggest that the government is in a far weaker position um, than it had been previously. So that chase against the, or that contributes to, to thinking about this moment is unique. Um, another feature that is um, that contributes to making this moment significant is, um, as uh, Miguel really well laid out, the opposition is deeply splintered. Um, and this is significant because sectors that previously were able to identify or feel represented within the broad coalition of the mood, the, 
movimiento de unidad democrática, the longer feel that sense of representation that leaves, um, especially more radical sectors of the opposition with, with very few avenues to participate, one of which, of course, then becomes the street. Right? So the splintering of the opposition, especially in the wake of last December's regional elections, which in fact yielded a significant, um, uh, significant margin of victory for, for the government, um, uh, leads to um, leads to uh, this, this 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 sense by which um, uh, uh, sectors of the opposition are unable to feel themselves represented, and therefore creates a, um, a gap in terms of leadership and, and support. The third mer um, feature that makes this moment unique, just one that um, people like myself um, earlier had imagined actually to be a benefit, but in fact has turned out to be less so is the fact that for the first time in 10 years, um, actually more than that, um, Venezuela is, uh, has no scheduled elections for two years. So previously, you had at least one election, either uh, national, uh, referendum, presidential, regional, um, municipal, um, uh, in each uh, calendar year. Um, which now, you know, at the, in the moment, um, after December, uh, uh, analysts consider to be a, uh, a pause, right? A sort of a moment for, for both sectors to pull back. Um, in the case of the government, to be able to enact some measures in order to quell and to combat the social and economic problems without suffering an immediate political cost in the ballot box and the polls. And on the part of the opposition, to be able to take these two years and go out in the streets and build a majority support that could win in the ballot box. Right? So um, this, this moment was seen as, as a potential one of opportunity, but in fact, the absence of um, this electoral outlet, um, in fact, um, in, in the context of the weakness of the um, of both the government and, um, and the splintering of the opposition, meant that um, those radical sectors feel like they have no other option than, in fact, to take to the streets. Right? So the absence of elections, rather than channeling um, polarization into um, an electoral landscape, uh, leaves it open to um, uh, uh, to more um, direct forms of action and. Um, Right? So these three factors contrive to make this particular moment um, coming together quite unique in the broader context of a 15-year period of intense polarization that has been marked at times by this sort of these uh, episodes of high intensity such as we're seeing today. However, one key continuity remains within their, these various cycles and uh, up until the present moment which is that the composition of the protests remain primarily, not exclusively, primarily middle and upper class, both in terms of its, uh, the people who are participating in the demonstrations and also where they're located, sort of the geography of the protests. Although, um, Miguel's correction, I think, is a really important one to consider that um, it's no longer just in Caracas, but in other urban centers um, where we're seeing some of these, um, some of these demonstrations, in fact, um, much more intensely than um, Caracas to some extent. But the, this, this notion that there is this very strong sort of class um, composition to the, the protests suggests, again, that despite the, the, um, the broader context, um, uh, the, the similarity in terms of the class, um, the underlying class divide remains a feature of, um, of Venezuelan polarization, which therefore presents this with this paradox or this riddle, why the social and economic indicators of the poor and the government's underperformance is so clear of popular sectors who are most disproportionately affected um, by these problems, not doing in the context, right? And to this, you have three basic responses, which I'd like to problematize. The first response is from the opposition, and Miguel sort of suggested it, which is they want to protest. They want to come out, but they're um, held hostage by these um, uh, armed gangs in the, in the batteries where they live, which um, are in service of political vigilantes, um, and therefore keep lying. Right, in the, in the virus. And so that's why they're not coming. Although they would want to, they could. Um, uh, as I will show, hopefully, this is in fact um, a very problematic and to some extent self-serving um, explanation because it doesn't take into consideration the fact that the popular sectors have always been in the streets. In fact, this is the protesting in the streets for any number of things has been, as my book suggests, uh, the sine qua non of democratic participation among popular sectors. So the issue is not so much um, that there is, um, you know, that popular sectors have not taken to the streets in this case, um, uh, but rather why are they not, no longer there, right? And so um, that's the question I'm gonna try to, to parse out. So the explanation that they're just afraid doesn't seem to hold water in the context of what in fact has been sort of significant presence in the streets over the last um, 15 years and much longer. The government's response is equally weak. 
The government's response is to say, well, of course they're not participating because they're pleased with everything that's been happening. They're pleased with the new um, emissions, the, the redistribution of oil wealth, the um, sense of participation, both either um, uh, real or imagined, um, but received, right? Um, and this explanation is problematic because, especially relative to the way in which the government has presented the threat level, which is as a coup, right? If this is a coup in motion, either a long-standing or a soft coup or a slow coup or whatever term you want to use, when it is not in all cases, but in many cases, when it has called people out to the streets and to defend um, it, the demonstrations have not yielded the kind of mass participation that we've seen in other periods when similar threat levels have been um, um, have been uh, presented by the government. Right? So there seems to be a disconnect in terms of what we call Venezuela um, poder de convocatoria, power to convoke, um, uh, both by the, by the government and also by the other. Most analysts' response is to say, well, I mean, this makes a lot of sense. The opposition doesn't provide credible alternatives that would motivate um, uh, the risks of mobilizing. Um, and because primarily their interests are around civil and political rights, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera, and not really social and economic rights, which are the ones that most motivate popular sectors to, um, to take to the streets. Right? So this, um, this lack of alternatives, this lack of, um, uh, of, of credible alternatives is what accounts for the, the, the lack of mobilization in part of popular sectors. There's some truth to all three of these responses, but they also this is a major factor that, um, again, my work uh, helps to reveal, and that has to do with the way that urban popular sectors in Venezuela, and I'm talking here about working classes, the poor, who constitute the bulk of the population. Venezuela is the most urban country in Latin America. 94% of its population lives in cities. Um, how they understand democracy and the way the popular understandings of democracy have systematically been sidelined and assumed by regimes of various types over the last 50 years. The answer to the riddle, Hopefully I'll try to explain a little bit more, is that the reason why people in popular sectors do not participate in this moment of protest, even though they have continuously taken to the streets in the past, is because they perceive it as an insurrectional movement. It's not a strong insurrectional movement, mind you, but an insurrectional movement nonetheless, one that dismisses the vote as a primary, though certainly not exclusive, locus of popular expression in the democracy. I think it's, my, uh, it's, um, uh, it's belief in the vote as a powerful tool of accountability, one that requires defending and protecting that most distinguishes popular understandings of democracy in Venezuela from elsewhere in the region. Right? So it just um, builds up a little bit on, on what Miguel was mentioning before, that when it, um, uh, the, the idea that the government is democratically elected, and then um, uh, coupled with the sense that um, this conveys powerful legitimacy to, um, to the government, that's what um, governs whether popular sectors participate or not in, in, um, in a movement of this type. So to start, the fact is that Venezuelans, um, to, to, not to start, to, <laughs> uh, just to, to lay this out here, um, Venezuelans have already been on the streets. They've been in the streets, they've been in the streets for a long time, massively before February, in fact, right? Um, uh, because the streets have been historically a place parts of lost to express grievances, not uh, to the state, not against the state. And this is the key distinction that's being drawn, right? that uh, the streets become a place to express grievances to the state, not against the state. Um, and so some of these, uh, these are just headlines from one of the major newspapers in Venezuela. Um, uh, back in October of 2003, the mayor, one of the mayors, one of the six mayors of Caracas, um, Antonio de Lesma, an opposition mayor, uh, was commenting on the fact that Venezuela must have a the world record in protest because there were so many protests happening all the time over things like shortages, inflation, um, uh, scarcity, uh, uh, insecurity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some of the headlines also um, suggest a little bit of what um, those protests were about. So, for instance, in February, first the, on February 1st, um, a study came out that was measuring how many protests have been happening over that month, and they sort of averaged it out to two protests a week over insecurity in the streets. Um, uh, in other places, like the 7th um, January um, uh, headline, uh, the forms of protest tend to be very similar, which is to close roads, which is exactly the kinds of things that we're seeing now. So the modality of protest is the same, right? The modality of protest is the same, and the quantity of protests are very high. Um, uh, uh, primarily over insecurity. Um, in the 30, uh, January 30th, you see motorizados, as, uh, um, as George was describing, these for people on motorbikes, or at the moment, with that, previous to the 
uh, demonization of the term colectivos, they have been organizing to protest the measure by the city to restrict their mobility um, uh, um, in Caracas. Um, uh, protest over um, water, um, uh, water shortages, um, protests over the lack of housing, um, protests over um, uh, uh, protests over um, the lack of access to prison, um, family, uh, family who's been imprisoned. Um, all of these yielded over these various months and years protests that are very much similar to the ones that we're seeing today. Which therefore suggests that the, what's really different is not so much the modality of the process or the quantity, but their nature. What is their demand? And what is the perception of the demand of the protest? Right? Um, and so this is where the, the, the key sort of insight becomes um, significant. The nature of the protest is perceived as insurrectionary. It's perceived as an effort to oust the government. And in this context, the effort to oust the government becomes a direct challenge to the legitimacy of the government in the context of electoral democracy, right? Which therefore suggests that the history um, that I'll just very briefly touch on because we're almost out of time, that the history of popular sectors, especially going back to 1958, is one of taking to the streets in support of the right to elect governments. Not in support of individual governments, but the right to elect governments. This is the foundational feature of public understandings of democracy in Minnesota. I'm going to look at this in the context of the 23 de Enero, um, which is this neighborhood which was built in the 1950s as an effort to clear the landscape of slums in Caracas and, and replace them with these hyper-modernist um, uh, high-rises, 15 stories tall, um, upwards of 500 apartments um, in one of these um, buildings. The image that you see on the bottom left is the um, one small snippet of the neighborhood today. And today it's now a combination of these high rises as well as these squatter settlements that have risen up, especially over the con um, uh, after the, um, the government that first built them uh, uh, um, in the 1950s, which is the military dictatorship of Pérez and Venice. Um, <coughs> but the reason why this neighborhood is significant is because each government that has come in, uh, in the context between its creation and today has attempted to locate the, uh, the neighborhood as one of its major areas of symbolic support. So the dictatorship that built it in the 1950s named it after the date in which it came to power, which is in, um, in, on December 2nd of 1955 that became the name of the neighborhood. Um, then that government was overthrown on January 23rd of 1958, and the name was changed to January 23rd, 1958, which is the name that it currently has. As well. And now um, you, uh, you have uh, Chavez um, uh, had a very significant relationship with the neighborhood precisely because of the histories that um, George mentioned of popular struggle, of revolutionary struggle, and he's buried actually in the neighborhood, um, Hugo Chavez is, right? However, all of these efforts, all of these um, sort of uh, links between these various regimes and the, and the neighborhood have in fact the lie that it's been a contentious history of incorporation. And this contentious history of incorporation is expressed, for instance, in the fact that residents did not take to the streets to support Perez Jimenez when he was ousted in 19, um, on January 23rd, 1958. They did not vote for the major parties of the government that came to the governments that came to power after 1958. In fact, over the 1970s and 1980s, they continued to vote for third parties as opposed to the major two parties, Ale and Gobe. And even though they voted for Chavismo when he was in power, they very much take autonomous, um, strong, autonomous strands that sometimes force Chavez to openly call out sectors of uh, organized sectors of, um, of the Ventures de Enero as anarchic or too radical, or having to be um, having to be quelled, right? So again, all of these suggest a very autonomous strain on the part of this particular neighborhood vis-a-vis -vis the government. At the same time, oppositional. Um, this is just the. I'm not going to dwell into it, but this is that chart that I was. Uh, this is a representation of the, the voting patterns, which in fact suggests that um, people in this neighborhood were not voting um, for the two parties in power until much later um, in the, the two-party period. Democratic period. Um, but oppositional movements also did not have support. And by this I mean opposition to the, uh, to the democratic system, um, to, especially to the democratic system of governments that came to power after 1948. For instance, 
Um, uh, they set up barricades, not unlike the ones that we're seeing today, when in the transitional government after 1958, um, there were efforts to oust that regime. Um, and so this became a way to take to the streets to, to, again, to protect the vote and to protect the integrity of the electoral system as the primary channel to express the non grievances. They did not, as I mentioned, vote for major parties until the 1980s. They rejected guerrillas. Um, they rejected the guerrilla warfare, or the guerrilla strategy of the 1960s of the left to, again, to seize power by, by armed means. They did not participate massively. Um, here's a, just a, a, an image of um, uh, right before the elections of 1963, the urban guerrilla stage, a series of high-level um, uh, um, uh, spectaculars of displays of violence in order to get people not to vote. And in fact, there was a tremendous degree of participation, so that call failed, right? Um, and this, I uh, just want to linger here for one second. I don't know if you can read the, the quote, but this is from 1958, right after the um, elections. And what it says is, Si, sí, mi arma es el voto, pero que no coman cuento los conspiradores, que yo también sé manejar otras armas. And so basically, yes, my weapon is the vote, but let not the conspirators um, you know, believe otherwise. I know how to handle other votes. And so on one hand, he has the ballot. On the other hand, he has the rock. And this illustrates really perfectly this um, interplay between the ballot box as the place where legitimate grievances are, um, are channeled, but also the street um, as a place where accountability is exercised extra-institutionally vis-a-vis the government. Right? This is the fundamental dynamic. We vote and we protect the right to vote, but we protect the right to participate in the street to exact and demand accountability from the regimes. This is the fundamental dynamic. Um, okay. um, and this is something that we've seen again and again in this neighborhood and in fact in others. So for instance, in the 1980s, um, uh, in terms of demanding accountability for, um, for insecurity that was very high at the time, people in the neighborhood organized in self-defense brigades, which today would be, um, which today would be like colectivos, right? In the 1989 Caracaso, which George's book really um, uh, deals with very extensively and very well, again, you had people taken out the streets of, uh, to protest um, economic measures and others, um, but not as an insurrectional movement, a rebellion for sure, but not as an effort to oust the government. Um, uh, you know, the same problems that we're seeing today, contra la comida cara, expensive food, desempleo, unemployment and repression, y la represión, people in a neighborhood organizing around those features um, in the 1980s and 1990s. And students um, early in the 1990s participating in violent demonstrations, again, to, in this particular context, to protest uh, an effort to curtail the, um, the uh, free um, uh, bus fare that students had, right? And so the point is here that the, the protests in the streets are plentiful, they happen all the time, but they're directed against achieving particular aims, securing accountability on the part of the governments that we have elected, not to oust the governments that we have elected. I think, the, just to tie it all up, one of the clearest um, sort of examples of this tension or this interplay that I'm suggesting where it's most manifested is precisely in this sort of founding moment by some of, um, of the current Bolivarian government, right, the Chavista government, which is um, 1992, on February 4th, the first coup that Chavez staged, um, in which uh, there was no level, significant level of popular support. In fact, polls afterwards showcased tremendous degrees of support, not for the government again, but for the electoral system, as the primary legitimate way to mount and express grievances, coupled with the streets um, as a place to, uh, to levy those grievances, specifically to the government, not against the government. And then in 27th November of 1992, a second coup, which again did not yield popular support, with the conditions um, uh, as bad or worse as um, we see today. And again, yet the, the level of popular support was not there. So finally, to conclude, um, you know, how does this help us to think about the, this paradox that I mentioned before? The question is not so much why popular sectors have not taken to the streets, but rather why have, have they left them. Why have they left the streets in this moment when otherwise the social economic factors suggest that they should be there? And it's because popular sectors reject insurrection and movements. They defend the street as, an, an, as a legitimate place to seek out accountability when institutional responses fail, or even to prevent pent up grievances, but at the same time defend the vote as a legitimate expression of popular support. Right? And so any movement that seems to, um, to tend to threaten the, the basic principle of the vote. Right, as, a, as a guarantor of, um, 
accountability becomes uh, an insurrection. So a popular sector says Venezuela defense is not governments, but the right to elect governments, and once in power, the right to hold them accountable institutionally or extra institution. So this, beyond class-based um, definitions or explanations, beyond definitions that are about ideological support or opposition to particular governments, this fundamental attachment to the idea of the vote is one that has been protected and legitimated at any given time, and whether or not movements that take to the streets or um, political movements that take to the streets are in support or against that, that's primarily what tends to govern whether or not popular sectors join um, in the protest. Thanks so much. Questions and comments from the public? So, first of all, thank you so much to the three panelists um, for coming. It's very difficult, as I'm sure you know, to get information about what's happening in Venezuela and who the different parties are. So, um, so it's really wonderful that three specialists have been able to come and explain to us in historical and also in political perspective um, what's happening and who is it that's on the street and who is it that's not on the street. Um, so I've been following the situation through um, mainstream newspapers, New York Times and The Guardian, most The Guardian mostly, and um, they seem those papers seem to have recognized that this is a class struggle. Only recently, really, but, <laughs> but this is, you know, middle and upper class versus popular classes, and the middle and upper class are on the street. And, um, and always starting with students, and of course the students are, you know, central in this protest, as students have been in many protests over the course of, well, the 19th and 20th century in Latin America. So what happened to, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about students. So where are the leftist student organizations? Um, how is it that all of a sudden students are representing the center right um, and even extreme right? Um, so that, that's my, I have a lot of other questions I'll let other people <laughs> ask, but that's my first question is how is it that students who are always at the vanguard of the, um, you know, the revolutionary left, how is it that suddenly the students are now of the right? There are about 2.5 million students in Venezuela. Um, there has been a tremendous expansion of the university structure in Venezuela in the last 15 years with the creation of not only the existing autonomous public universities, but now also the Bolivarian universities. So that when we talk about students, we have to problematize which students we're talking about. Um, since 2006, um, with the RCTV closure and after the de electoral defeat of the opposition and the ballot box, Students, primarily from some public universities, others from private universities, became the actual de facto face of the opposition. So they're not new in the political arena in Venezuela. They have been as, as divided and as polarized as other sectors of society. So what we've seen is an effort to utilize the students as sort of the face of the opposition, precisely because what you mentioned, they're so identified with change. Historically, we think of the 60s, we think of that process, we think of uh, France, we think of Mexico City, um, but the reality is it's much more complicated. With the application of uh, the entrance exams, with the costs associated with universities, um, the, the process of who is a student became much more selective. I'm not suggesting that somehow the middle class and upper class students weren't always present, uh, but they are much more in some levels in some universities in Venezuela, particularly those of the Central, Simon Bolivar, and the other more particular specific universities. So that my point is that the student character itself has changed, but, but not all students are involved in the protests, as I pointed out. 2.5 million students in Venezuela. We have not seen in Venezuela the protests we saw in Chile, or that we've seen in Mexico, we've seen in Colombia over access. Uh, because that issue has been, has been addressed at some level. Uh, there's always issues about budgets and about salaries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the very nature of the students and the characters change, and they have been, for the last 10 years, a central feature of the opposition. Oh, I would just add that... <laughs> um, I would just add that in, in the broad historical perspective, there was also this error made by the radical left in the 80s, which was lar largely recognized as an error uh, today, which was to effectively abandon the elite especially public universities like the UCLA as a terrain of struggle and to work instead in the barrios. Um, and what happened in the process of doing this was that the universities fell into largely into the hands of more conservative student groups at the same time that the early you know, governments, especially in Caldera in the mid-90s, the, the Chiripero government, began a process of neoliberal technocratic reform of the universities 
that ended up instituting these kind of barriers to entry, extra fees, um, and effectively gentrifying these universities, even the public, the very good public universities. And so this led to a democratic, demographic transformation of these universities, um, and this political question was involved. Um, I would also add that the, you know, so this has been developing over time, and it really began to bear political fruit for the opposition in 2006 and 2007, with these big student demonstrations. And at that time, what you had was a struggle over over the meaning of who was a student, because this student movement emerged that claimed that it was the students. Uh, and then it gave rise to a whole other movement of Chavista students, often from these same universities, but also some of them from the missions, from the Bolivarian universities, saying, no, we're also students and we're also you know, part of uh, making demands around what it means to be, to be a student. And one of the difficulties is that the, the students often have to avoid being associated with opposition political parties. And yet it's very clear that the opposition political parties are always involved in these things. And so right after the student um, you know, movements that emerged in 2007, almost every single one of those political of uh, these student leaders joined an opposition political party immediately. And the, they're among some of those who are very present today. And so this has really become an Achilles heel. And so now again, the opposition is looking for student leaders and desperately looking for anyone who's even poor looking uh, to be a student leader. Um, and not doing very well. There's one, the you know, the head of the student federation at UCB is, you know, is you know, is, is the child of doctors, and he upholds Romulo Betancourt as his sort of political forefather, who's the, the sort of kind of brutal founder of, of Venezuelan democracy. Um, and then there's this sort of young spokesperson, not even a student from the barrios, and they're like, oh, look at this guy Yeager. Um and it turned out that. This kid from the barrios that they tried to use as a spokesperson and put forward was actually an employee of the main opposition political party. So this is part of the, the struggle of these parties as well to reassert their, you know, their political uh, control. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, my question about is about the idea of dialogue. I think it's it's clear that Venezuela needs dialogue, um, but. Uh, I think one of the tensions, especially within the, um, the pro-government support base, is about uh, is, is over the fear that a uh, process of dialogue might lead to further concessions to the right. Um, so I, my question is about um, the prospects for either a, re a further deepening of the revolutionary process under Maduro um, versus uh, the possibility that that dialogue could lead to a uh, kind of a, um, uh, a, uh, a slowing down of, of the revolutionary process. I know under Chavez, uh, when Chavez, the Chavez government was confronted with uh, threats of various kinds from the right and from uh, economic elites, um, the reaction was largely to, uh, to radicalize, to, to nationalize more industries, to further broaden the process of popular participation. Um, so, uh, how would you three, uh, it's not for anyone in particular, but how would you evaluate the, the prospects for, uh, uh, for further development under Maduro in that regard? That's, uh, that's the question. <laughs> um, and just really well posed, too. Um, so, my sense is that my sense is that the, the, way to, to, the way that Maduro is going to navigate that question is by isolating or separating the political, um, the political question from the economic question. On the economic side, they face tremendous problems, and these are well acknowledged, and these are problems that are deeply embedded in the structure of a petrostate, um, in which domestic production has, um, has, uh, has, been, has been never really taken off. Um, and so you're already seeing some economic measures to try to um, address some of those issues. So for instance, uh, pretty soon we're gonna see an increase in the price of gasoline that has already been proposed, which incidentally has been uh, rejected by the opposition. Um, uh, in a really strange kind of you know, anti-pro-populist uh, vein, which is um, confusing to parse. Um, they've instituted a free-floating exchange rate which is something that Chavez uh, rejected for, for a long time. Um, they have um, uh, uh, the, uh, the other um, uh, major sort of policy uh, feature on the economic front um, has been to begin to pay off some of the debts that have been accruing um, to, uh, to international um, companies or others. Um, all of that 
has an effect domestically in terms of being able to distribute rent, right? So there's an economic cost. But in some strange way, what the protests have done is allow it some allow Maduro some maneuvering room on the political front to be able to say, we are not going to negotiate on political aims. We're not going to negotiate, for instance, on the um, on the basic principles of a Bolivarian socialist state and deepening the kind of communal um, efforts that we have um, have, we have implemented, but we are going to make some um, some economic uh, adjustments, right? So um, this, to me, seems to be the way that the the, the two are the two positions are being um, negotiated. At least Maduro seems to be negotiating those positions by isolating the economic front from the political front and deploying the protests as a way to be able to sort of marginalize the opposition politically while giving himself um, some maneuvering space um, to make these difficult economic uh, choices. Yeah, to that I would add just what you're saying is exactly what many radical sectors in Venezuela said. They, they said, what is Maduro doing? And even before these protests, they said, why is he meeting with, with Polar, the biggest you know, company in the country? Why is he making these deals with big business? Um, and this is the concern by, you know, you know, from a lot of radical sectors, that the negotiation is precisely with sapping the energy, that it reveals something more than just strategic, maybe, that Maduro is really planning to take a a radically different course than Chavez did. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that as the as the former vice president, also Vicente Rangel put it recently, the negotiation process is a pressure cooker for the opposition. Um, it's destroying opposition unity. It's you know it's having a really devastating effect on the opposition's political credibility because it's forcing them to split into who will negotiate and who won't. Um, and when you pair that with the fact that the fact that Leopoldo Lopez is in jail and Maria Corina was thrown out of the National Assembly, so now the moderate sectors of the opposition also need to defend these radicals that they would like to distance themselves from. So you have, you have the opposition in this very, very tense situation that is, uh, it's something that I think the Chavistas are gonna sit on and let it play out because it's, it's only gonna work politically to their advantage in the long run. I just want to describe that in an article about that Venezuela now faces a Tea Party phenomenon in the opposition because you have essentially a faction of the opposition that now ref that considers it treason to negotiate, that considers it um, treason even to engage in conversation. So it was very obvious who was not there last night. It was Voluntad Popular, uh, Bravo Pueblo. So you have the very forces that are there present who are not who are not there who have the one been leading the protests. So on the one hand, this opposition now confronts a situation where. They are negotiating. If you were just to look at the Twitter account for Capriles when he announced, or when the MUD announced, um, Abellero announced that they were they were going to not have protest on the anniversary of Chavez's death. Um, they called him everything from traitor to uh, you, you could imagine the other names. Um, so that in that sense, I think that that, that the government has has a space. And what that has done is, because of the government interprets it as an insurrection, and popular forces interpret it as insurrection, they have closed ranks in some way that allows Maduro a little bit more negotiation. Although if you look at Aporrea, once in a while you'll see again the same kind of comments about is he betraying the revolution or is he not? And in fact, the majority are saying that negotiation is not a betrayal for the government, that the negotiation is not a betrayal of the revolution at this point. But it was very symbolic to see Mendoza, the head of the largest enterprise in Venezuela, sitting with Maduro and Maduro saying, we, will, we accept your notion within socialism in the 21st century. That was the, the thing that, that, that most caught my attention when he said, yeah, streamlining bureaucracy, uh, adjusting dollar values, and allowing you to import more is compatible with 21st century socialism. I just have one tiny thing here. Um, it's something like really important to realize that the Chavista coalition is splintered among moderate and radical sectors as well. And that's the kind of thing that Maduro needs to negotiate. And it was much in evidence in April with how close the vote was. Um, and you know that reflected a loss of significant support coming from the October elections that had given Chavez a you know a, a huge victory, um, and I think there was a real moment for uh, for Maduro um, and for Chavismo in general to assess who are our ideological supporters and who are our non-ideological supporters, and how do we um, negotiate that balance in an electoral context where we need the votes to be in power. Right? But we also realize that some non-ideological supporters will easily, or at least be more likely to depart if two things are available. One, 
the social and economic conditions can continue to worsen, and two, if there is an alternative, a credible alternative in the opposition. So far, that second point has not been present. And so that provides them with a maneuvering room. But the first point is certainly there. Right, and so they need to address those 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 efforts, and to the extent that it, it does chafe against some of the more sort of radical sectors, I believe that that's, a, that's a, uh, Maduro has made that choice to some extent, um, problematically for sure. But um, uh, you know, again, to sort of maintain that electoral majority, he needs to address the non-ideological sectors before the opposition, finally after 15 years, says, you know what, we should have a credible alternative. We had a question over here. Um, um, how strong is the connection, or do you, think, do you think there is a connection between the U.S. government and opposition forces? I know Lopez is a Harvard graduate, I think. I believe, excuse me. Do you think there's a connection there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on the Harvard graduate thing, it's kind of funny. If you go on opposition Twitter accounts, they'll say things like, Leopoldo, uh, uh, oh no, 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 yeah, they're talking about Lopez. They say Leopoldo Lopez went to Harvard and Maduro was a bus driver. And I read that and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> and what they mean is it's how terrible a thing is that our, our country is actually being run by the, the uneducated bus driver and not by the Harvard graduate. But that's kind of a side. The US government openly still funds the Venezuelan opposition, more openly than it did under Bush. Um, it's, it was five million in the budget, the 2012 budget request, three million in 2013, I don't know what it is you know, for 2014. Um, the money goes generally through USAID, um, which, as we, you know, if you've been paying attention, was also now, you know, involved in the Cuban Twitter uh, scandal, doing the work of the CIA, providing it cover by essentially saying we're, you know, we're not in, we're not the U.S. government, we're this other entity um, that the funds are funneled through. Um, the U.S. embassy, and I don't know how these this money works, but the U.S. embassy also has direct directly requested appropriations to distribute in Venezuela to opposition political leaders, although, you know, again, I don't know where that comes from. And this is, this is not a new thing. Um, what is new is that it is now illegal under Venezuelan law to accept funds from foreign governments. And so, uh, where, where before it was politically damaging and suicidal to say we, we're taking money from the U.S. government, now it's also something that can get, you know, get opposition you know, parties in, in a lot of trouble. And so that's one of the, the things involved. But the money is still going to these parties. Um, uh, Primero Justicia, which was the, the party that both Lopez and Capriles come from, was essentially founded by the U.S. government through its funding through the International Republican Institute and USAID that went in saying, we don't have any opposition parties anymore. The parties have disintegrated. We need a new opposition. Who do we find? How can we train them? How much money do we need to give them so that they would be an anti-Chavista political force? And that's where Primero Justicia comes from. So that's where all of these people, uh, in a lot of ways, come from. Maria Corina Machado is even, you know, her organization, Sumate, is funded by USAID, and, you know, uh, as well. So this is this is clear and direct. And what's more to be speculated on is the role of the embassy at this moment. You know, it's been very active. That much is clear. You know, there have been meetings, there have been phone calls, but it's you know I think that will come out more uh, in time uh, when things move forward. Can I make a comment? Um, I think you know. I mean, I appreciate that you're here and educating us, but I think you are presented presenting one side of the situation very much so, and I really disappointed and frustrated about it. You mean the, the facts what I, you said? Yeah, yeah. The, I the think the situation in Venezuela is much more complex than what you are presenting here. It's not only the fault of the middle class, upper class, who is gauging this opposition. I mean, I have family in Venezuela. They are not middle, upper class. They are lower class lower class and they 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 are suffering okay it's a lot of suffering by everybody i think that if we keep talking in that way we are simplifying we are not conveying what the reality in venezuela is i disagree with you you are all the time in all your conversation blaming the middle and the upper class the students no, the students now are middle and upper class. They, are, they don't represent the population of Venezuela. No, the protests 
is not mere upper class. There's representation of everybody. Where are the popular, the 23 de enero? You know, they have to work. They don't have the time. Students go to university. Well, that's the way they can do something. You know, the situation is, is chaotic. I mean, is is bad. What happened with the money? Where is the money from the oil going? Corruption. The government. There is not corruption in the government. In the Chavez, all the money from the oil. Where is going? We know there are many people in the government that now they have luxury, they have money outside the country. This is the government. If we keep blaming the middle class, the upper class, the imperialism, I am not from the right. Never. I am I consider myself socialista. Okay? That is not what is in Venezuela is not socialism, and we need to call it the way it is. We are talking here to the University of Michigan, to all these students, and we are not saying what actually is going in Venezuela and what is happening in Venezuela. Okay, I think what the view you are presenting is one-sided. I remember, I recall that I started by saying Very there were serious problems in Venezuela. I said they were the economy, I said that they were inflation, I said they were crime. Uh, I will gladly include corruption. I don't think anyone on this panel has said there are not serious problems in Venezuela. But on the other hand, you have to say where the protests are. They are in Altamira, and in Chacao. They are in Palo Grande, in La Florida. They are not in 23 de Enero. They are not in the poor neighborhoods. That's simply a reality. That's not making propaganda or making okay. a statement of the other. Excuse me, I listen to you. I, I, I listen I to answer, you. Yeah. I think you have the, the opportunity to listen to what we're saying. I don't think anyone here has said that they're not serious problems. There are problems in everything you said, from corruption, from shortages, from bureaucratization. But the response, I think we all agree, is that, that an insurrection, and there has been an effort, an insurrection, is not going to resolve the problems. Um, whether we like it or not, the protests have been primarily in middle and upper class neighborhoods. That has been the, the defining characteristic of that these protests not true. in these that areas. That is not true. Well, uh, the, that is not I think true. if you were to look at the Nacional Universal or Glovisión, you were going to find that that's the reality. That's what happened in Venezuela. I was in an upper middle class neighborhood, and that's where the protests were. You went outside the neighborhood, there were no protests. That's a simple reality. So but I also agree, I also agree. I don't think you need U.S. funding to have protests in Venezuela. I think that there is enough of a position among these social sectors and enough complaints to merit protest, except that the context of the protest is that an insurrection is, that it aims at overthrowing a democratically elected president will not succeed in Venezuela. That's my only point. A democratically elected government, that's a question mark, because who has the power, who has the money, who has the money? Who has the money to actually give to people and buy people? Ma'am, excuse me. Vote. We need to let everyone else, if they have a question yeah, or I, something. I'm sorry, so. but I'm just cutting off of this one side. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, your Democratic opposition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you can, I know you touch upon, uh, upon violence and how it's functioning, but the situation is still very unclear to me. Um, so I was wondering if you can make that, maybe shed some more light on that and like, if in your point of view there has been excessive use of force on the side of the state and that's something, you know, that we could say that they're doing wrong, so how that's functioning? Oh, there has absolutely been excessive use of force by agents of the state. This was especially the case on February 12th. Um, there are, I believe, still five confirmed deaths by at the hands of official security forces. Um, and thankfully, this is something that's been uh, responded to. There are you know, dozens of arrests now of security forces. On the initial day, it was intelligence officials, Semin officials, who were, according to Maduro, not supposed to leave the barracks that day, defied an order, left the barracks, and were seen discharging firearms around where some of the students were killed. So this is, this is absolutely undeniable. We've also seen cases of excessive force in arrests um, where people have been hit and beaten. And you've also, I'm very glad to say, seen uh, large numbers of arrests um, for those. And so there is, at this point, um, in terms of Guardia Nacional, National Guard, and these other civilian and police officials, large numbers that are arrested and uh, under investigation. 
Now, on, you know, on the other side, you have the deaths of six National Guard who were killed um, around, in and around the barricades, usually while clearing the barricades, often by snipers. And this has been obviously much more difficult, and there have been far fewer arrests with regard to these, with these shootings. Um, and then you have a whole lot of people killed who are either affiliated with the protests um, or uh, not affiliated with anyone, or Chavistas killed in and around the barricades under very confusing circumstances. Some were killed by these wires that were hung on purpose along the barricades, beheaded uh, motorcyclists. Um, some people were killed when they attempted to cross the barricades to get to work. Um, so, and many more were attacked and killed when they attempted to clear the barricades. Um, opposition students have been attacked um, by people who have been called, you know, in terms of the topic of my talk, collectivos, um, but, you know, it's still unclear what that meant exactly, um, presumably by Chavistas, by armed Chavistas. Um, and then there, were, uh, there, are, oh, there are a number of deaths that are completely unclear as to who, you know, who was responsible. That's more or less where the deaths fall. Um, and in terms of the question of excessive use of force, though, it's important to bear in mind that there's a huge disparity between what one sector of the human rights community is saying about what's going on um, and what another sector is saying. Um, and what the sector that's getting a lot of play with the opposition and with the international media is essentially doing is collecting all claims of abuse by security forces and publishing them essentially as fact. Um, unquestioned fact. Um, and it's not to say that you know there's no validity to these claims, but it is to say that some kind of investigation is necessary. Um, the UN rapporteur on torture has said that what has arrived at them, you know, again, not even to the Venezuelan government, but to the UN, as claims warranting consideration as torture um, are two to three claims. And of course, these also need to be seriously investigated. The government itself is investigating, you know, 50 claims of torture or something like that. One of the problems has been how crime is reported and how violence is reported. Uh, Venezuela has always had a very high crime rate. Venezuela is one of the most armed, Venezuelans are among the most armed people in Latin America. And there's also evidence that, that there's been some existence of organized crime organizations, paramilitaries and also gangs. Uh, having, so in other words, that, that was part of the backdrop within the question of crime in general. But on the question of violence, what's troubling is when you use terms like genocide. Or when you use terms like crimes contra la humanidad, against, against humanity. Because those are the terms that are being thrown around. Uh, if you, I encourage you to visit opposition websites and see how, how they say words like genocide. That genocide is being carried out in Venezuela. 40 deaths is tragic. I condemn 40 deaths, no matter who can carry them out. The problem is that, that there isn't, and the government has condemned them, and I, I, I agree with everything George said about the, the violence on the part of the government forces. The tragedy, though, is that not everyone condemns violence. And I think, and, and you, and condemns the violence as a means of achieving an end. And that's the larger question here. Because, in fact, that those actions at the barricades, I mean, I walked down streets, and I will give you an example. I was aware of the, the cables up at, up at this level. So I was very cautious when I was walking down the streets to watch for cable. But what I wasn't looking for was something that was cables that were put down at five inches, meant for you to trip and trip and fall. Uh, and that's what I ran across as I was walking on the streets. So this is the kind of the trap that was set on street, city streets to, to make sure that people would not go out and walk. And then you would also see the streets covered in oil. Now, why on earth would someone throw oil on the streets? Because a motorizado coming down the street in a motorbike would skid out. And in fact, someone was killed that exact same way. So we have to condemn all that violence, not just selectively condemn violence, and not use terms like genocide. Because I'll give you a counterweight. In 1989, during the Caracaso in Venezuela, when the, the military was set out to repress the population mercilessly, there were hundreds killed. Some would say even thousands killed. That's what happens when the state releases, uh, unleashes the military uh, on the population. So that's, we have, we have a, a point of contrast within Venezuelan society. That's not to condemn violence, that's to condemn all violence. And we have a question in the back, and then Diana? Yeah, so it's actually a follow up question on, this, on violence in the state. Um, I was, in, I was in Venezuela in 2006, and probably some things have changed since then, but some things haven't. And at the time, crime was rampant, and especially the police was very heavily involved in crime. And, uh, they actually got robbed by police, and it was very traumatic. And we were talking to friends there who were from the popular sector, and who were chavistas, and we were, we were people were saying, what's going on? How is, it, how is it that you know Chavez can't control the police? And they were like, well, you know, the thing is with the police, if he fires all of them, they're, just, they're all armed, and they're all, they all have their connections to to um, organize crime organizations, they're just going to go out on the streets and they're going to terrorize everybody. So 
what I was really surprised by, because I was coming so, from a sort of very Leninist common sense position at the time, was that, you know, you, you take over the state and then you have the state, at least you can start working with that. And it seemed like people who were in Chavistas and were being very realistic about it, they're saying, well, we have the government, but it doesn't mean that we have the state. It doesn't mean that we have the military, it doesn't mean that we have the police, um, and, and that's okay. I mean, they seem to be very sort of um, patient about that. Um, and it seems to me, like that in a sense, I mean, this is especially came up in your speech, that the, um, the sort of realism or pragmatism or even sort of pessimism about what it is that a revolutionary regime, regime can even do and what it can't do, and all the limitations that are, that, that are placed upon it, seems to be just have gotten uh, more, more sad since then. That's, yeah, absolutely. Um, as you were speaking, what was coming to mind is, um, is a couple of things, specifically having to do with the, the police issue. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's more acute in places like Caracas, I and mean, this speaks a little bit to, unfortunately she left, but um, to her idea of you know, what is replacing what was there before. And George, as in your, in your writings you've mentioned this, it's, I think it's fair to say, very much so, that Venezuela is not a socialist country. I mean, most of the productive apparatus is still in private hands. Yes, certain sectors have been nationalized. Um, others have just gone bankrupt. It's not that, uh, I mean, the oil industry was nationalized in the mid-70s, then it was privatized in the 90s and it was renationalized. But the idea that this is sort of like an achievement of, 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 of socialism of the 21st century is, is mistaken. On the other hand, what that does suggest is that Venezuela is sort of in this liminal space. It's very rhetorically and discursively um, you know, uh, socialist. Um, and then that, of course, leads to its opposite reaction, discursively primarily. But at the level of what's happening in the streets, it's a mixed economy, and it's a liberal state on top of a participatory, you know, it, uh, sort of burgeoning participatory efforts, right? And so this tension, this contradiction is manifest all over the place. And police one being one major one of them. So for instance, in the case of the police in Caracas, as I mentioned briefly, you, know, you have, I teach in, in New York, and so the example that I like to give is imagine if in New York each one of the five boroughs had its own mayor. And then on top of the, on top of the five borough mayors, there was a supra-mayor. And each one of those mayors has its own police force. And each one of those, poli each one of those mayors and their police forces are political antagonists. It's decentralization gone mad, basically is what it is. Um, and, uh, you know, and under Chavez, the problem with security was twofold. On one hand, it was the issue that, you know, Venezuela has a long trajectory of resort, and Maduro has done this, and Chavez resisted it, which has a long trajectory of resorting to outright state violence when there are episodes of um, huge, uh, you know, criminality. Just let's unleash the military, or let's, you know, do these operativos where we send out, you know, um, the National Guard to specific sectors. And Chavez resisted it because he had sort of a more humanist understanding of crime. Like, you know, if we just adjust the social and economic conditions and people won't, won't be so prone to commit crimes, right? Um, that didn't pan out. And so when Maduro came to power, right, when he was elected, he sort of moved in the direction of let's, you know, let's do these, uh, militarize some of the police forces. The other thing that Chavez did was, um, uh, for instance, he got rid of the uh, Policia Metropolitana, that supra capital police force. Um, and implemented uh, sort of a national police force to, to streamline the process, and so hopefully also to, you know, to streamline, um, uh, you know, uh, education towards the police. Right. So I guess my point is to say that Venezuela is very much a mixed country. It's, a, it's mixed socialist. It's mixed capitalist. It's mixed, um, you know, liberal. It's mixed participatory, and all those contradictions play out in these sort of ebbs and flows of policy that are very uncertain. Yeah. I'll just add that the, the, it's, there's a built-in tension that's all the more sharp when it comes to policing, which is, first of all, as, as Alejandro said, the police were part of the problem historically. It's tremendously violent, involved, directly involved in the drug trade, still directly you know, tied. I mean, even under, you know, in just recent years, the Ministry of Interior was saying something like 80% of crime was tied to members of the police forces, or something like that. And I don't, I don't remember the context for the study, but um, the problem is, what force do you use to fight against the police? Um, and so the, the task was to replace these existing police forces with a new national force, um, to somehow simultaneously keep crime in check, um, and to somehow also sort of disarm any opposition from those police, as you know, someone mentioned, you know, throwing them out on the street with their guns and allowing them to just directly integrate into, into uh, violent crime. 
there's a parallel in, in prison policy, and here it also gets even more tense, namely the fact that now that you, now that you have national police in Venezuela, if you ask a lot of poor Venezuelans who, uh, you know, for, for decades, of course, the complaint is police repression, police repression, police repression, people today now say, uh, you know, the national police are too soft, right? They can't handle crime, they're not tough enough, because they're being educated in a humanist, socialist way, and there has been real, real, you know, there's been real progress made in the way the police are educated and trained. Um, well, on the question of, of, of women, I don't think that in the case of Venezuela, we see it, this is not unique to Venezuela, we've seen it in the case of Chile, in the post-Pinochet era where gender was very much used as, as a, a, a organizing, mobilizing force under the assumption that somehow uh, women's role was being redefined by the revolution um, and also the loss of privilege of women and using womanhood and, and all motherhood and all those kinds of notions and that's precisely what we're seeing in the case of Venezuela as well um, and, and what we're seeing it is used as an organizing tool uh, over, over privilege in this case over the position of privilege but highlighting women because then the notion somehow is that women are being more tar are, are feeling the effects of the economy because as the, 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 the household as the home they can't find food um, and that they can't take care of, they can't uh, fend for their family. So it's, it's an appeal that uses gender-based uh, or, or stereotypes uh, to try to mobilize and then within the context of the protest uses a hyper-masculinity to sort of uh, foment and critique men. But at the root of it is still a defense of privilege uh, and it's still of a defense of, of a social class. So it's conflating both gender issues and class issues in ways that, that we've seen elsewhere. We've seen in Chile, we've seen elsewhere used uh, in that context. Yeah, in response to, to this last question, which I thought was, um, I think what you're getting at is, is precisely like what does the opposition offer in contrast to Chavismo? And why has that not had more of a, you know, more support over the years? Um, you know, one of the really fascinating features of the opposition in the government, well, in the elections of October of 2013, or 2012, the last ones that Chavez ran in, was that this was the first time when it was clear to most people, I think, that the terms of the debate had changed in Venezuela. And the opposition's platform at the time was that not we don't want to get rid of many of the programs that the government has put in place, that the Chavista government has put in place. We want to make them better. We want to make them more efficient. Um, and there's a fundamental recognition there that, um, you know, in terms of sort of the, 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 the way in which the balance between oil revenues, which are, you know, controlled by the state and collectively owned, and how they're allocated, should be should have press that balance the um, you know the distribution of it should have to give precedence to popular sectors right and so that kind of recognition was really hard to interpret for a lot of people especially those who had non ideologically supported Chavismo because they're like well is this an alternative or is this kind of you know Chavismo plus and you've been telling us over the past six you know, you know at that point you know seven seven eight years. That, um, that everything that Chavismo is doing is bad. And so this kind of fundamental inability to sort of you know, pin down uh, an actual alternative becomes a problem. Um, the really significant part, though, is that, uh, and also very tragic, I think, is that in the wake of the December elections, as I mentioned before, which did kind of showcase uh, a resurgence in support for Chavismo after the very razor-thin victory in April, there were actual significant calls on the part of people like Capriles, people like Enrique Falcón, the opposition mayor of Lara State, that um, number one, we're not a majority, and number two, we have to build a majority, and number three, we're primed to build a majority because of all these social and economic factors. What we need to do is focus on those, right? And so there was this moment um, in January when you were seeing a tremendous amount of self-recognition on the part of the opposition that this was the strategy. And to some extent, the protest, by giving much more primacy to the sort of radical sectors of the opposition, have unfortunately sidelined those efforts. Um, so, you know, the question that I like that I like to pose is, you know, once this so this radical sector of the opposition leaves the streets, that's when you're going to see the government really sort of teeter, <laughs> you know, be not, not teeter in terms of its stability. But that's when you're going to start to, and you're starting to see more and more protests again, like you were saying in December and January, over immediate issues. And to the extent that the government is not able to respond to those, that's the real threat, right? Um, so yeah, in terms of you know what does it propose? 
Um, that's uncertain. Right now, it seems to be tar trying to target these very finite you know, social and economic problems as a way to build an electoral support, insofar as the government isn't able to do that. To do that. And, and just to add a little bit, real quickly, the opposition has failed to distance itself from an overall overarching symbolism pushed by its more radical sector that is a symbolism of loss. That namely, ever since Chavez came to power, what, what happened is that we lost our rightful place, right? And this is rightful in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of history. Um, it's expressed as well in, you know, through the sort of gocho identity that Miguel was talking about, uh, because so many political leaders also came from this Western uh, state. Um, and it was seen that, you know, just certain, certain people are, are legitimately our legitimate rulers of this place. And Chavez was not one of them. He doesn't look like one of us. He doesn't talk like one of us. Um, and there's been a, a very negative tendency to slide back into that. It's everywhere. If you look at Twitter, if you look at the more radical sectors, um, the idea that you know this is about taking our country back. Again, it's a very Tea Party sounding rhetoric. We're taking it back from who? Right? The people who elected the majority. Um, on the Colombia question, I think, I mean, firstly to say it's not, this is not directed from Colombia, but there are a whole bunch of important questions to bear in mind. First of all, the flashpoints in Tachina, in Medina, these are states that are absolutely full of paramilitaries. This is an incredibly porous border on the western side of Venezuela. Um, these are you know, paramilitaries that are incredibly right-wing, um, and of course, as we know, tied to, in many ways, various sectors of the armed forces and the former president, Alvaro Uribe. The television station that was pulled off of Venezuela's satellites, the Colombian television station, is, has direct links to Uribe in a lot of senses, and is seen as a spokes, as a mouthpiece of, uh, of Uribe in, in Venezuela. Um, more fundamentally, though, a lot of sort of more radical Chavistas, this raises the question of, of, of fascism, and this is something that we hear a lot. Um, now, I'm not talking, though, about Maduro's definition of fascism, um, even if, if that's clear, necessarily. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's legitimate to use the term. I think we should be clear what it means. It's not a reference to European phenomenon. It's a reference to a very specific set of characteristics that are very important today in Venezuela. And what people are pointing out is that there is, on the one hand, a moderate opposition, and on the other hand, a growing and established fascist right wing. What they mean by fascist is radically anti-democratic, anti-communist, organized into attack squads in the streets. And this is a continental phenomenon. In Bolivia, it's been a growing phenomenon. In Colombia, of course, um, and, in, in, and in Venezuela. And it's growing and becoming more influential um, through these students and through these, these organizations. Um, and there's a great, and there's a way of looking at these and saying these are in some ways Uribista, they're tied to you know, Uribe youth in Colombia, and there's a great deal of continental you know, um, uh, agreement and, and sort of cooperation going on. And you know, Chavistas quickly show pictures of people like, uh, you know, like a previous meeting with Uribe and smiling and things like that. Um, it's much more complicated with Santos at the presidency, and if Uribe is reelected, this, this gets much more complicated still, but that's sort of a general uh, you know, outline of some of the importance that Colombia has in that, in that. So we will conclude here. Please join me in thanking the panelists for the wonderful